In today's world, a city looks like this. But 20,000 years ago, a city looked like this. In this landscape exists a labyrinth of caves and overhanging rocks that provided the perfect location for an ancient society to thrive. Evidenced by numerous rock paintings that, hidden away, have outlasted the pressures of time. This is the Lost City, and it's home to one of Australia's largest mysteries. To get here, we left our hometown two years ago and sailed two and a half thousand nautical miles to arrive in the Kimberley, where we've just spent the last few weeks Croc. dodging crocodiles, chasing waterfalls. We've got the luxury of endless fresh water. And feeling incredibly humbled by the sheer scale of this immense dreamscape. All right, guys, we are upping anchor heading towards the river mouth again. It's high tide in about half-ish an hour. And we're gonna cross back outside the bar. We're heading for a really, really cool place. It's a lost but not forgotten city. We're currently in the King George River. And today is a small commute of about 20 nautical miles over to Glycomus Bay, where we'll be anchored up with yet again another waterfall. Now this is refreshing. <laughs> and just a few nautical mile tender trip away from the lost city. But we've got to get a wriggle on this morning as lectures start at midday. Now that's why she sets. The only thing is you put down a 20 kilo anchor and every time I bring it up, it's got about 20 other kilos of like mud on it that has been buried in. Nice. Yeah, I, we've been sleeping well with the rock, no, I'll say that much. So far, the review is really positive. <laughs> we've confirmed the rumours. That there's nothing quite like it. Like, I wish we'd just made the change earlier is the only thing. <laughs> but, anyway, oh, look at that. The mud's getting off it. We'll bring it up and see. You may remember from last week how we had to cross this shallow bar. And without too much detail on the charts, we sort of just winged it. I think we're going to be relying more on Google Earth and our eyesight than the waypoint, which is watching the depth sounder, taking it slow. This time around, though, we are feeling a bit more relaxed about it. The good thing about coming in is that you now have a track to follow to go out. So always make sure that you turn your track on when you're going in and out of these places, because. You can just follow them back out and you know you're sweet. Unless you hit something, then don't follow it. Go an alternative way. <laughs> Try a new way. <laughs> Try a new way. <laughs> Looks like we're going to be wing on wing again today, so I'm going to run a preventer line out and, um, oh, well, I guess that's what I'm doing. I'm running the preventer line. A preventer for those that aren't familiar with sailing is a line we run from the cockpit up to the foredeck and back along the other side of the boat, where we then attach the line to the end of the boom. We do this when we're sailing downwind, as when the boat slews off a wave, the wind can catch the main from the wrong side causing an accidental jibe. This can cause serious damage to the boat and to your crew who weren't expecting the boom to come flying across, basically sweeping anyone up in its path. In the case of being backwinded, the preventer will stop this from happening. Another downwind trick is of course to set up the pole for the headsail, which today we are avoiding doing as we only have a few miles to cover while goose winged. All right, sailing now, but we're still goose winged and we don't have a pole out, but we're only just managing to hold it. The swell's not too big out here, so that sort of contributes to, you know, how well you can hold the head sail out without the pole. So, yeah, we've got six miles like this, so should be all right, hopefully. But a pole would limit your head sail from doing this. If we're going long, a long way today, I would 100% get the pole out because it'd be way more comfy, but it's just six miles. <laughs> Man, we are hooking at the moment. We must have some tide or something with us because we're sitting on about seven and a half to eight knots. Really? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. 
so the goose wing got us where we need to be, and it's time to cut back towards the land. As we're slowly making our way through the Eastern Kimberley, we're discovering how little this whole area is accurately charted. While the main shipping routes are relatively surveyed, when approaching a bay that cruising yachts make good use of, you're often met with a line like this, meaning it's the end of the road for chartered territory. We're about to cross the little unsurveyed line. It's a good thing that there's been plenty of sailors before us and some of them were kind enough to draw little mud maps so well you have to have your own eyeballs well and truly on there is some really good information written about these areas so super grateful for that and it always makes me think the initial like expedition sailors and everything like that man the set of as Christina would say cojones they have on them that goat has really big cojones <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> Big set of cojones doing this without charts and surveys. <laughs> Bloody hell. We're here, sort of. Glycomus Bay is made up of two bays. The first one is super exposed to the current conditions and would be pretty yuck to anchor in. However, the second bay will be incredibly protected. The only catch is, to get in there, we will have to cross over yet another uncharted bar. We're slowly creeping in. We're getting kind of used to doing these like uncharted bar crossings. We could say it's technical, but it's not. Our approach, the same as our last crossing, to just very slowly move Nakama through the water while keeping a close eye on the depth sounder. In this instance though, it's made a little easier as the banks make the deeper water super visible. Looks like we're a little bit late into the dry for the waterfall to be flowing, but um, you can see the depth contour line where it drops off. The waterfall must have like really gotten all the silt out of here and it's a nice deep anchorage, so that's good to know. This is another beautiful anchorage. Now I have to jump into a lecture. It's always an interesting balance sailing around Australia while trying to complete our degrees. But what we'll never take for granted is when there is a break in classes, we can close the laptop screens and see what's new in our backyard. Woohoo! We just got our first little mangrove jack of the trip. I just got Soph to drop me off on this little rock wall here. I'm just gonna de-hook him. Quite a nice little size jack. Just getting back in the water. So I've started back home, grabbing us some shower stuff. I thought I'd have a little click off this rock. Really stoked I did. First little jack, that's cool. He's questionable to size and I didn't have a ruler with me. So I played on the safe side, we let him go. From the boat, the waterfall looked all but dried up. But upon closer inspection... Wow, we've just come for a little cruise underneath this waterfall. There is a little bit of water running and it's quite majestic with the mist in the wind. It's not the greatest water pressure nature has on offer, but as we're heading for an outing into the city, we'll have to make do with the majestic mist in order to spruce up for the occasion. Oh, that looks nice. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> it's so cold. <laughs> Which way did you come up? Um, yeah, probably straight up there. <laughs> the only problem is as much as shampooed, then you gotta find a stream up to get it out. <laughs> oh, this one's a good one. Oh, that's so good. Are you enjoying the shower? It's good. Our whole Kimberly series is just gonna be like, where can Slim and Soap shower? <laughs> I just can't get over like, it's very exciting being able to have a fresh water wash. Most of the time. It's so luxurious here in the Kimberley. <laughs> you get hooked on flat night sleeps and freshwater washes in the Kimberley. It's cold. Mm. 
we're still pinching ourselves as to where we've gotten to. The Kimberley region is proving to be like no other cruising ground we've sailed through. And it's crazy to think that this is only just the beginning. We've, we've had the champagne sitting in the bottom of our fridge for a while. Sort of waiting for like a perfect moment, but I don't know if you'll ever quite find yeah. a perfect moment to, I mean, this is a pretty perfect moment it's to pretty pop a nice. champagne. But we thought like we never have actually really like cheers to really like being in the Kimberley in yet. The Kimberley yet. Yeah. And it's like being underway. I feel like we've done, we've so, done we're well and truly really in the Kimberley now. Yeah, we're just gonna do a little celebratory champagne yeah. pop in. <laughs> You never quite look graceful when you're popping a bottle of champagne, do you, though? My, my face is always like... Oh, so much anticipation! Better not put the cork in the water here, you won't be diving in after it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Think it's nice, you can hear the waterfall now. Yeah. So cheers to an epic season. As we sit here, done with uni for the day, enjoying each other's company while anchored in front of our new waterfall view. We can't help but be grateful for not only how much we've achieved, but also for the support we've had along the way. We wouldn't be here on YouTube and sharing this journey without our patrons, donors and sponsors. So as we sit here, you might be thinking, that's a really nice rug. We've had so much positive feedback from viewers already loving their naming this later rugs as much as we love ours. We couldn't help ourselves. So we're so stoked for the legends at Name This Later to be this week's video sponsor. While the rug is currently covering our muddy decks, you might recognize this rug from inside where it covers our deteriorating saloon cushions. We've been putting the Naming This Later rugs to the test in various locations throughout our lap of Australia. And it's safe to say that Yep, they are pretty damn versatile and look good pretty much anywhere. Not only do they come in a range of cool designs, but NTL are doing their part for the environment by turning wasteful fast fashion into long lasting and quality pieces that are made from 100% recycled cotton. If you check out their site through the link in the description below, you'll get 15% off your first order. And you'll also find that the rugs are reversible, machine washable, and yep, pretty damn stylish. Anyway, check them out guys, they're, they're, they're actually that good, we love them. All right, it's about five in the morning. We've just woken up. We have to get out of here at around eight o'clock or we can, nine o'clock would be the latest. But since being here, we haven't yet checked out the Lost City. We've had uni on every morning when the conditions have been nice and it's been too windy in the afternoons to go there via the tender. She's bumpy, all right. I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to make it in the tender. We decided to call it. It's blown up. So it's today or never. So we're up super early and as soon as the sun's up and it's not so crocky, we'll drop the tender and zoom up there and have a look. And then, yeah, we've got a bit of a sail ahead of us. There's no marked trail to this place, but if we've landed our tender on the right beach, then there is a good chance we may be able to rediscover Australia's lost city. I can see all the overhangs. Rumoured to be located within these habitable sandstone cliffs and caves is arguably one of Australia's greatest unsolved mysteries, arising from a very unique art form. It's not until you step inside its walls that ancient streets, alleys and courtyards are revealed. You can almost hear bustling streets from 20,000 years ago and you immediately feel how this place earned its name, the Lost City. It's beautiful. You can tell that it would have been like a little village sort of set up or you can imagine it would be a little village sort of set up, but it's fine where they painted the stuff. Life here is evidenced by incredibly preserved artworks. It's basically like an ancient art gallery, but it's not as easy as walking through the doors of the Louvre. You gotta have been painting up in here. 
we're going to have to go hunting for these treasures, looking underneath various overhangs, caves and cracks. As if you weren't paying any ear. You let your imagination guide you to the places where you can see gatherings and ceremony taking place within sheltered rock-walled rooms. Or maybe you just get familiar with the landscape. I found one. It's starting to, starting to look more promising here. You can see where it's black, where the water gets to on the rocks and where it's not. So I started just looking in the orange bits and just up in here. Oh, cool. It's a dancing. Where he's got a spear. As we start to know what we're looking for, the paintings slowly begin at revealing themselves. I found one in here. Sort of just random lines and circles, but it's definitely something I'm not sure what. You almost just knew there had to be some under this ledge. Once you start figuring out what to look for, like the big ledge and no black from the rain, you're in for a good bet. And I was like, there'll be some here and bang, you can see it from this far away. It's really, really well preserved. In the present day, the traditional owners of this land call these Goin Goin. However, in the past, the paintings were alternatively known as Bradshaws, after Joseph Bradshaw, the first white explorer to stumble across them. We've just found some really, really nicely preserved ones along this ledge. I love this stuff. <laughs> you could, uh, I could spend ages up here. The, more, the longer you spend in here, they just start popping out to you more because you get used to what to look for. But in saying that, you would definitely, I, I'm sure you would be able to find artworks up in these caves that not that no one's ever seen before, obviously, but that no one's seen in a very, very long time. These Goin Goins are shrouded in mystery, as they are entirely unique from any other Indigenous rock art found here in Australia. Until this day, the origin of the art is not definitively clear. As far as we're aware, no artistic claim has been made to the paintings by any Australian Indigenous nation. This painting behind me is probably the coolest one I've seen. These ancient masterpieces typically depict slender and elegant figures, often featuring ornate dress, including tassels and armbands, and they've been likened to that of African tribes. There's a few theories as to how these paintings ended up here, but there's one theory that through the linkage of a few things stand out to us as being relatively plausible. It has something to do with some nearby boat paintings that are believed to be the world's oldest depiction of a boat. The presence of a rather strange tree, the Boab, native to Africa, and the discovery of a very large egg. Not just any egg, but found in North Australia was the egg of an extinct Madagascan ostrich-like bird called the elephant bird a three metre, 450 kilo land bird that produced a seven litre egg. So the theory goes, perhaps these drawings came from ancient Madagascan seafarers that enjoyed an omelette. Or perhaps the birds just walked across on an old land bridge. Or perhaps it was aliens. But our money is on the seafaring Madagascans, especially because the seed of a boab tree contains some of the highest levels of natural vitamin C. Pretty good for fighting off scurvy on a long ocean voyage. Or again, maybe they just walked across that land bridge with a couple of seeds in their pockets to trade with the aliens. Regardless, whoever and however the artists made it here, it appears that they eventually succumbed to the harsh elements of the region, leaving behind the paintings that tell a story of their existence. This one I managed to like bond with the most because I'm like, I can imagine just crevin here. It could be a rainy day outside, something like that. It could be horrible weather and you're just sitting in your cave. You've got your little seat. This is the, this is the artist I most resonate with here. This is such a good painting position. Got a spear, big headpiece. The ruffles on the neck, a bit of adornment on the arms. Alright, it's 6.50. We got up at, what did I say, 5. Got down here, first light, so we didn't get eaten by a croc trying to beach the tender. We've had a good, like, 45 minute run through these caves, and it's time we've got to start meandering back. And then, um, yeah, big sail today, so we've got to go get into it while the tides are in our, while the tides are in our favour. Can't meander too long. Yeah. Yeah, I came across that rock. I don't know. No, I was down here. Yep. Easy to get lost in these caves, eh? Very easy to get lost. Well, I'm really glad that we found some in the end. 
beautiful day for a motor sale. Look at the conditions out there. Flat as a cake, isn't it? We want it flat because we really want this day because it's the nicest day until it starts blowing up over the weekend. And we need to get around this like notorious cape. And so we really need- Today. We need today where we have to motor. We want a motoring day to get around it. Yes, that's why we're not sticking around longer. If you were wondering why well, I do it in a rush all the time, you bloody kids rushing all the time, there's a method to the madness. You don't always get to do what you want to do when you're sailing. You have to do what you're told. So we're doing what we're told. Today's the day we got to go. It turns out temporarily we did become a little disorientated. Maybe now's a good time to check our track down. Took us a while, but we found our track out. Basically got half walking, half sliding and tripping down this cliff. But we're there, we're on the beach. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed that video and found the mystery of the Bradshaws as intriguing as we do. We apologise for this video being a day late. We've been struggling to juggle editing, study and sailing at the same time and personally I just wish that there were more days in the week to get everything done. We always strive to get a video out punctually every week, however sometimes we fail to do that. So if you're enjoying the videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button alongside the bell button which will notify you exactly when we release our new and latest videos if you don't want to miss a video that is anyway guys thanks for tuning in thanks to our patrons as always for making this show possible and thanks to naming the slater for jumping on board and sponsoring this week's video we'll catch you next week